It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across the courtyard which had once been a garden to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or the dissecting rooms. A flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red baize, and through this Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room, fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with mirror glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the house the fog began to lie thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He didn't rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you've heard the news. The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you. And I want to know what I'm doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I buy my honor for you that I am done with him in this world. It's all at an end. And indeed, he doesn't want my help. You do not know him as I do. He's safe. He's quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He didn't like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he. And for your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone. But there is one thing on which you may advise me. I have, I have received a letter, and I am at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I'm sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection, asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I'm quite done with him. Utterson ruminated a while. Well said he, at last. Let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand and signed Edward Hyde, and it signified briefly enough that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had so long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labor under no alarm for his safety, as he had a means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. Have you the envelope? Utterson asked. I burnt it, replied Jekyll, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? Utterson asked. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now, one word more. Was it Hyde who dictated the terms of your will about that disappearance? The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You have had a fine escape. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word with Poole. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? But Poole was positive. Nothing had come except by post. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly, the letter had come by the laboratory door. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition, shocking murder of an MP. That was the funeral oration of one friend and client, and he couldn't help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was, at least, a ticklish decision that he had to make. And self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly. But perhaps, he thought, it might be fished for. Later, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest, his head clerk. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, said the lawyer. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned Guest. The man Hyde, of course, was mad. I should like very much to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. 
It's between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It's an ugly business at best. But there it is, quite in your way. A murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened. And he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said. Not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then, a servant entered with a note from Mr. Utterson. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why? Do you want to see it? Oh, one moment, I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously compared their contents. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why do you compare them, guest? He inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note in his safe, where it reposed from that time forward. What, he thought, Henry Jekyll fought for a murderer? And his blood ran cold in his veins. My devil had long been caged, and he came out roaring. I was conscious even when I took the draft of a more unbridled and a more furious propensity to ill. I declare no man morally sane could have been guilty of that crime, and that I struck in no more reasonable spirit than that in which a sick child may break a plaything. Instantly, the spirit of hell awoke in me and raged. With a transport of glee, I mauled the unresisting body, tasting delight from every blow. And it was not till weariness had begun to succeed that I was suddenly in the top fit of my delirium, struck through the heart by a cold thrill of terror. A mist dispersed. I saw my life to be forfeit and fled from the scene of these excesses, at once glorying and trembling, my lust of evil gratified and stimulated, my love of life screwed to the topmost peg. I ran to the house in Soho, and destroyed my papers. Thence I set out through the lamplit streets in the same divided ecstasy of mind, gloating on my crime, light-heartedly devising others in the future, and yet still hastening and still hearkening in my wake for the steps of the Avenger. Hyde had a song upon his lips as he compounded the draft and as he drank it toasted the dead man. The pangs of transformation had not done tearing him before Henry Jekyll, with streaming tears of remorse and gratitude, had fallen upon his knees and lifted his clasped hands to God. I sought with tears and prayers to smother down the crowd of hideous images and sounds with which my memory swarmed against me. And still, between the petitions, the ugly face of my iniquity stared into my soul. As the acuteness of this remorse began to die away, it was succeeded by a sense of joy. The problem of my conduct was solved. Hyde was thenceforth impossible. Whether I would or not, I was now confined to the better part of my existence. And oh, how I rejoiced to think it. With what willing humility I embraced anew the restrictions of my natural life. Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward, but Mr. Hyde had disappeared as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, indeed, and all disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seems to have surrounded his career, but of his present whereabouts, not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out. And gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Utterson began to recover from his alarm. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that the evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed relations with his friends, and became once more their familiar guest and entertainer. 
On the 8th of January, Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other as in the old days when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor is confined to the house, Poole said, and sees no one. On the 15th, he tried again and was again refused. On the 16th, he went himself to Dr. Lanyon's. There, at least, he was not denied admittance. But when he came in, he was shocked at the change which had taken place in the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly balder and older. And yet, it was not so much these tokens of swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice. As a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death. And yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought. He's a doctor. He must know his own state and that his days are counted. And the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet when Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with the air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. I've had a shock, he said. And I shall never recover. It's a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir. I used to like it. I sometimes think if we knew all, we should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill, too, observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed, and he held up a trembling hand. I wish to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll, he said in a loud, unsteady voice. I am quite done with that person, and I beg you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. And then, after a considerable pause, Can't I do anything? he inquired. We are three very old friends, Lanyon, and we shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done returned Lanyon. Ask him yourself. He will not see me, said the lawyer. I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I am dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you. And in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. A week afterwards, Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight he was dead. The night after the funeral, at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room, and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend. Private, for the hands of J.G. Utterson alone, and in case of his predecease, to be destroyed unread. So it was emphatically superscribed, and the lawyer dreaded to behold the contents. I have buried one friend today, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And then he condemned the fear as disloyalty, and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure, likewise sealed, and marked upon the cover as not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance. Here again, as in the mad will, which he had long ago restored to its author, here again were the idea of a disappearance and the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Lanyon. What should it mean? A great curiosity came to the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honor and faith to his dead friend were stringent obligations. And the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. It was a fine, clear January day. Wet underfoot where the frost had melted, but cloudless overhead. And Regent's Park was full of winter chirrupings and sweet with spring odors. 
I sat in the sun on a bench, within me licking the chops of memory. The spiritual side a little drowsed, promising subsequent penitence, but not yet moved to begin. I smiled, comparing myself with other men, comparing my active goodwill with the lazy cruelty of their neglect. And at the very moment of that vainglorious thought, a qualm came over me, a horrid nausea and the most deadly shuddering. These passed away and left me faint. And then, as in its turn the faintness subsided, I began to be aware of a change in the temper of my thoughts. A greater boldness, a contempt of danger, a solution of the bonds of obligation. I looked down. My clothes hung formlessly on my shrunken limbs. The hand that lay on my knee was corded and hairy. I was once more Edward Hyde. A moment before, I had been sure of all men's respect. Wealthy, beloved, the cloth laying for me in the dining room at home. And now I was the common quarry of mankind. Hunted, houseless, a known murderer, thrall to the gallows. My reason wavered, but it did not fail me utterly. My drugs were in one of the presses of my cabinet. How was I to reach them? That was the problem I set myself to solve. The laboratory door I had closed. If I sought to enter by the house, my own servants would consign me to the gallows. I saw I must employ another hand. And thought of Lanyon. How was he to be reached? How persuaded? Supposing that I escaped captured in the streets, how was I to make my way into his presence? And how should I, an unknown and displeasing visitor, prevail on the famous physician to rifle the study of his colleague, Dr. Jekyll? Then I remembered that of my original character, one part remained to me. I could write my own hand. Thereupon, I arranged my clothes as best I could, and summoning a passing hansom, drove to an hotel in Portland Street, the name of which I chanced to remember. At my appearance, the driver could not conceal his mirth. I gnashed my teeth upon him with a gust of devilish fury, and the smile withered from his face. Happily for him, yet more happily for myself, for in another instant I would certainly have dragged him from his perch. At the inn, as I entered, I looked about me with so black a countenance as made the attendants tremble. Not a look did they exchange in my presence. I took my orders, led me to a private room, and brought me wherewithal to write. Hyde, in danger of his life, was a creature new to me. Shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain. Yet I was astute, mastering my fury with a great effort of my will. I composed two important letters, one to Lanyon and one to Poole, and that I might receive actual evidence of their being posted, sent them out with directions that they should be registered. Thenceforward, I sat all day over the fire in the private room, gnawing my nails. There I dined, sitting alone with my fears, the waiter visibly quailing before my eye. And thence, when the night was fully come, I set forth. I walked fast, hunted by my fears, chattering to myself, skulking through the less frequented thoroughfares, counting the minutes that still divided me from midnight. When I came to Lanyon's, the horror of my old friend perhaps affected me somewhat. I do not know. It was at least but a drop in the sea to the abhorrence with which I looked back upon these hours. A change had come over me. It was no longer the fear of the gallows. It was the horror of being Hyde that racked me. I received Lanyon's condemnation partly in a dream. It was partly in a dream that I came home to my own house and got into bed. I slept after the prostration of the day with a stringent and profound slumber which not even the nightmares that run me could avail to break. I awoke in the morning shaken Weakened, but refreshed. I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me. And I had not, of course, forgotten the appalling dangers of the day before. But I was once more at home, in my own house, close to my drugs. And gratitude for my escape shone so strong in my soul that it almost rivaled the brightness of hope.
Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. Bless me, Poole. What brings you here? He cried. And then taking a second look at him. What ails you? Is Dr. Jekyll ill? Mr. Utterson, there is something wrong. Take a seat and here's a glass of wine for you. Now take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's way, sir, replied Poole, and how he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, and I can bear it no more. Come, said the lawyer. I see you have some good reason, Poole. I see there's something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play, said Poole hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened. What foul play? I daren't say, sir. But will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and greatcoat. The house, when they entered it, was brightly lit up. The fire was built high, and about the hearth all the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimperings, and the cook cried out, Bless God, it's Mr. Utterson. Why are you all here? said the lawyer. They're all afraid, said Poole. And now, he continued, addressing the knife boy, get me a candle and we'll get this through at once. And then he begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Mr. Utterson followed the butler into the laboratory building and through the surgical theatre with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here, Poole motioned him to stand to one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. Mr. Utterson, sir, asking to see you, he called. A voice answered from within. Tell him I cannot see anyone. Thank you, sir, said Poole with a note of something like triumph in his voice. And taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard and into the great kitchen. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? It seems changed, replied the lawyer, very pale. Yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir. Master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago when we heard him cry out upon the name of God. And who's in there instead of him? And why does it stay? This is a very strange tale, Poole said Mr. Utterson. Suppose it were as you suppose. Supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, well, murdered. What could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. Mr. Utterson, you are a hard man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Poole. All this last week, him or, or it, or whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's, that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on the stair. We've had nothing else this week back. Nothing but papers and a closed door and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody was looking. Well, sir, every day there have been orders and complaints and I have been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, there will be another paper telling me to return it because it wasn't pure, and another order to a different firm. This drug is wanted bad, sir, whatever for. Have you any of these papers? asked Mr. Utterson. Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note which the lawyer carefully examined. It ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Messrs. Moore, he assures them that their last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 1883, Dr. Jekyll purchased a somewhat large quantity from Messrs. Moore. He now begs them to search with the most sedulous care 
and should any of the same quality be left, to forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. Jekyll can hardly be exaggerated. So far, the letter had run composedly enough. But here, with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he had added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson. And then sharply, how do you come to have it open? The man at Moore's was angry, sir. He threw it back at me, returned Poole. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, is it not? said the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the servant rather sulkily, and then with another voice. But what matters is I've seen him. Seen him? repeated Mr. Utterson. Well, said Poole, it was this way. I came suddenly into the theatre from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open, and there he was at the far end of the room, digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in and gave a kind of cry and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. Sir, if that was my master, why had he a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I have served him long enough, and then... He paused. These are all very strange circumstances, said Mr. Utterson. But I begin to see daylight. Your master is plainly seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice. Hence the mask and his avoidance of his friends. Hence his eagerness to find this drug by means of which the poor soul might retain some hope of ultimate recovery. There's my explanation. Sir, said the butler, turning to a sort of mottled pallor. That thing was not my master, and that's the truth. My master. And here he looked around him and began to whisper. My master is a tall, fine build of a man, and this was more of a dwarf. No, sir, that thing in the mask was never Dr. Jekyll. And it is the belief of my heart that there was murder done. Pool. If you say that, it will become my duty to make certain. Much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled about this note, which seems to prove him to be still alive, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Ah, oh, Mr. Utterson, that's talking, cried the butler. There is an axe in the theatre, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. God had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which only broke in puffs and drafts into that deep well of the building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps, until they came into the shelter of the theatre, where they sat down silently to wait. London hummed solemnly all around, but nearer at hand, the stillness was only broken by the sound of a footfall moving to and fro along the cabinet floor. So it will walk all day, sir, said Paul. Aye, and the better part of the night. Only when a new sample comes from the chemist, there's a bit of a break. But hark again, a little closer. Put your heart in your ears, Mr. Utterson, and tell me, is that the doctor's foot? The steps fell lightly and oddly, with a certain swing for all they went so slowly. It was different indeed from the heavy, creaking tread of Henry Jackrow. Poole disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to the attack. And they drew near with bated breath to where that patient foot was still going up and down, up and down, in the quiet of the night. Jekyll! cried Utterson. I demand to see you! He paused a moment. But there came no reply. I give you fair warning. Our suspicions are aroused by fair means, then by foul. If not by your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice. For God's sake, have mercy. That's not Jekyll's voice. Down with the door, Poole. Poole swung the axe over his shoulder. 
The blow shook the building, and the red baize door leapt against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech, as of mere animal terror, rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again, and again the panels crashed. Four times the blow fell, but the wood was tough, and the fittings were of excellent workmanship. And it was not until the fifth that the lock burst asunder, and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. The besiegers, appalled by their own riot and the stillness that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight. A good fire glowing on the hearth, the kettle singing, a drawer to open, papers neatly set forth on the business table, and nearer the fire the things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, and but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. Right in the midst, there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe and turned it on his back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with a semblance of life, but life was quite gone. And by the crushed file in the hand and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. We have come too late he said sternly. Whether to save or punish, Hyde has gone to his account, and it only remains for us to find the body of your master. But nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll, dead or alive. They proceeded more thoroughly to examine the contents of the room. At one table, there were traces of chemical work, Various measured heaps of some white powder being laid on glass saucers as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had been prevented. That is the same drug that I was always bringing him, said Poole. There were several books on a shelf. One lay open beside the tea things, and Utterson was amazed to find it a copy of a pious work for which Jekyll had several times expressed great esteem, annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. Next, in the course of their review of the chamber, the searchers came to the mirror. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, said Poole. Next, they turned to the business table. On the desk, among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost and bore in Dr. Jekyll's hand the name of Mr. Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it, and two enclosures fell to the floor. The first was a will, drawn in the same eccentric terms as the one which he had returned six months before, to serve as a testament in case of death, and as a deed in case of disappearance. But in place of the name of Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Poole, and then back at the papers, and last of all, at the dead Mr. Hyde stretched upon the carpet. My head spins round he said. He has been all these days in possession. He has no cause to like me. He must have raged to see himself displaced, and he has not destroyed this document. He caught the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hand and dated at the top. Oh, Pool, the lawyer cried. Dr. Jekyll was alive and here this day. He cannot have been disposed of in so short a space. He must still be alive. He must have fled. And then, why? And how? Why don't you read it, sir? Asked Poole. Because I fear, replied the lawyer solemnly. With that, he brought the paper to his eye and read as follows. My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared. Under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee. But my instincts and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure and must be early. Go then and read the narrative which Lanyon warned me he was to place in your hands. Your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master has fled or is dead, we may at least save his credit. It is now ten. I must go home and read Lanyon's documents in quiet. 
but I shall be back before midnight when we shall send for the police. They went out, and Utterson trudged back to his office to read Dr. Lanyon's narrative. Dr. Lanyon's narrative. On the 9th of January, now four days ago, I received by the evening delivery a registered envelope addressed in the hand of my colleague and old school companion, Henry Jekyll. I was a good deal surprised by this, for we were by no means in the habit of correspondence. The contents increased my wonder, for this is how the letter ran. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends, and although we may have differed at times on scientific questions, I cannot remember, at least on my side, any break in our affection. Lanyon, my life, my honor, my reason are all at your mercy. If you fail me tonight, I am lost. I want you to postpone all other engagements for tonight and to take a cab and with this letter in your hand to drive straight to my house. Poole, my butler, has his orders. You will find him waiting your arrival with a locksmith. The door of my cabinet is then to be forced and you are to go in alone to open the glazed press letter E on the left hand, breaking the lock if it be shut, and to draw out with all its contents as they stand the fourth drawer from the top or, which is the same thing, the third from the bottom. In my extreme distress of mind, I have a morbid fear of misdirecting you. But even if I am in error, you may know the right drawer by its contents. Some powders, a file, and a paper book. This drawer I beg of you to carry back with you to Cavendish Square exactly as it stands. This is the first part of the service. Now for the second. At midnight, I have to ask you to be alone in your consulting room to admit with your own hand into the house a man who will present himself in my name and to place in his hands the drawer that you will have brought with you from my cabinet. Five minutes afterwards, if you insist upon an explanation, you will have understood that these arrangements are of capital importance, fantastic as they must appear. Think of me at this hour in a strange place, laboring under a blackness of distress that no fancy can exaggerate and yet well aware that if you will but punctually serve me, my troubles will roll away. Serve me, my dear Lanyon, and save your friend, Henry Jekyll. Upon the reading of this letter, I was sure my colleague was insane. But till that was proved beyond the possibility of doubt, I felt bound to do as he requested. I rose accordingly, got into a hansom, and drove straight to Jekyll's house. The butler was waiting my arrival, he had received by the same post as mine a registered letter of instruction and had at once sent for a locksmith and a carpenter. The tradesman came while we were yet speaking and we moved in a body to Jekyll's private cabinet. The door was very strong, the lock excellent, but after two hours' work, the door stood open. The press marked E was unlocked and I took out the drawer, had it filled up with straw and tied in a sheet and returned with it to Cavendish Square. Here, I proceeded to examine its contents. The powders were neatly enough made up, but not with the nicety of the dispensing chemist, so that it was plain that they were of Jekyll's private manufacture. And when I opened one of the wrappers, I found what seemed to me a simple crystalline salt of a white color. The file, to which I next turned my attention, might have been about half full of a blood-red liquid, which was highly pungent to the sense of smell, and seemed to me to contain phosphorus and some volatile ether. The notebook contained little but a series of dates. These covered a period of many years, but I observed that the entry ceased nearly a year ago, and quite abruptly. Here and there a brief remark was appended to a date, usually no more than a single word, double, occurring perhaps six times in the total of several hundred entries, and once very early in the list and followed by several marks of exclamation. Total failure. All this, though it whetted my curiosity, here was a file of some nature, was definite. a paper of some sort, and a record of a series of experiments that had led to no practical usefulness. How could the presence of these articles in my house affect either the honor, the sanity, or the life of my colleague? If his messenger could go to one place, why could he not go to another? and even granting some impediment. Why was this gentleman to be received by me in secret? 
twelve o'clock had scarce rung out over London, ere the knocker sounded very gently on the door. I went myself at the summons, and found a small man crouched against the pillars of the portico. Are you from Dr. Jekyll? I asked. He told me yes, and when I had bid him enter, I followed him into the bright light of the consulting room. Here, at last, I had a chance of clearly seeing him. I'd never set eyes on him before, so much was certain. He was small, as I've said. I was struck besides with the shocking expression of his face. This person was dressed in a fashion that would have made an ordinary person laughable. His clothes, that is to say, although they were of a rich and sober fabric, were enormously too large for him in every measurement. The trousers hanging on his legs and rolled up to keep them from the ground, the waist of the coat below his haunches, and the collar sprawling wide upon his shoulders. Strange to relate, this ludicrous attire was far from moving me to laughter. Rather, as there was something abnormal and misbegotten in the very essence of the creature that now faced me, something seizing, surprising, and revolting. Have you got it? he cried. Have you got it? And so lively was his impatience that he even laid his hand upon my arm and sought to shake me. I backed away, conscious of his touch of a certain icy pang along my blood. Come, sir, I said. You forget that I have not yet had the pleasure of your acquaintance. I beg your pardon, Dr. Lanyon, he replied civilly enough. What you say is very well founded, and my impatience has shown its heels to my politeness. I came here at the insistence of your colleague, Dr. Henry Jekyll, on a piece of business of some moment, and I understand... He paused and put his hand to his throat, and I could see that he was wrestling against the approaches of hysteria. I understand a draw... But here I took pity on my visitor's suspense, and some perhaps on my own growing curiosity. There it is, sir, said I, pointing to the drawer where it lay on the floor behind a table and still covered with a sheet. He sprang to it and then paused. I could hear his teeth grate with the convulsive action of his jaws, and his face was so ghastly to see that I grew alarmed both for his life and reason. Compose yourself, I said. He turned a dreadful smile to me, and plucked away the sheet. At the sight of the contents, he uttered one loud sob of such immense relief that I was petrified. And the next moment, in a voice that was already fairly well under control, Have you a graduated glass? With something of an effort, I gave him what he asked. He measured out a few minims of the red tincture and added one of the powders. The mixture, which was at first of a reddish hue, began in proportion as the crystals melted to brighten in colour, to effervesce audibly, and to throw off small fumes of vapour. Suddenly, and at the same moment, the ebullition ceased, and the compound changed to dark purple, which faded again more slowly to a watery green. My visitor, who had watched with a keen eye, smiled, set down the glass upon the table, and then turned and looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. And now, said he, to settle what remains, will you be wise? Will you be guided? Will you suffer me to take this glass in my hand and go forth from your house without further parley? Or has the greed of curiosity too much command of you? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. As you decide, you shall be left as you were before, and neither richer nor wiser, unless the sense of service rendered to a man in mortal distress may be counted as a kind of riches of a soul. Or, if you shall so prefer to choose, a new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power shall be laid open to you here in this room upon the instant, and your sight shall be blasted by a prodigy to stagger the unbelief of Satan. Sir, said I, affecting a coolness that I was far from truly possessing, I have gone too far in the way of inexplicable services to pause before I see the end. It is well, replied my visitor. Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of your profession. And now, you, who have so long been bound to the most narrow and material views, you, who have denied the virtue of transcendental medicine, you, who have derided your superiors, 
Behold. He put the glass to his lips and drank at one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched at the table and held on, staring with injected eyes, gasping with open mouth. And as I looked, there came, I thought, a change. He seemed to swell. His face became suddenly black, and the features seemed to melt and alter. And the next moment, I had sprung to my feet and leaped back against the wall, my arm raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! There before my eyes, pale and shaken, and half fainting and groping before him with his hands like a man restored from death. There stood Henry Jekyll. I was stepping leisurely across the court after breakfast when I was seized again with those indescribable sensations that heralded the change. And I had but the time to gain the shelter of my cabinet before I was once again raging and freezing with the passions of Hyde. It took on this occasion a double dose to recall me to myself. And alas, six hours after, as I sat looking sadly in the fire, the pangs returned and the drug had to be re-administered. At all hours of the day and night, I would be taken with the premonitory shudder. Above all, if I slept, or even dozed for a moment in my chair, it was always as high that I awakened. The powers of Hyde seemed to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll, and certainly the hate that now divided them was equal on each side. With Jekyll, it was a thing of vital instinct. He had now seen the full deformity of that creature that shared with him some of the phenomena of consciousness and was co heir with him to death. He thought of Hyde for all his energy as of something hellish. And that insurgent horror was knit to him closer than a wife and lay caged in his flesh where he heard it mutter and felt it struggle to be born and at every hour of weakness deposed him out of life. The hatred of Hyde for Jekyll was of a different order. His terror of the gallows drove him continually to commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of a person. But he loathed the necessity. He loathed the despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen, and he resented the dislike with which he was himself regarded. Hence the ape-like tricks that he would play me, scrawling in my own hand blasphemies in the pages of my books, burning the letters, and destroying the portrait of my father. And indeed, had it not been for his fear of death, he would long ago have ruined himself in order to involve me in the disaster. But his love of life was wonderful. I go further. I, who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the objection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. No one has ever suffered such torments. My punishment might have gone on for years, but for the last calamity which has now fallen, and which has finally severed me from my own face and nature. My provision of the salt, which had never been renewed since the date of the first experiment, began to run low. I sent out for a fresh supply and mixed the draft. The ebullition followed, and the first change of color, but not the second. I drank it, and it was without efficiency. I have had London ransacked. It is in vain. And I am now persuaded that my first supply was impure, and that it was that unknown impurity which lent efficacy to the draft. About a week has passed, and I am now finishing the last of the old powders. This, then, is the last time, short of a miracle, that Henry Jekyll can now think his own thoughts or see his own face in the glass. Half an hour from now, when I shall again and forever assume that hated personality, I know how I shall sit shuddering and weeping in my chair, or continue with the most strained and fear-struck ecstasy of listening, to pace up and down this room, 
and give ear to every sound menace. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold, or will he find the courage to release himself at the last moment? This is my true hour of death, and what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here then, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. <laughs>